Okay, I'm here with Professor Happer in, of all places, Las Vegas for a conference. And we're glad to have you, Professor Happer, at, Thank this, you. at this event. And I think the purpose of this particular discussion and interview is to essentially get into the topic of climate change, climate science, and have a little bit of background on you. So let's begin by how you would introduce yourself to the greater world. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I'm uh, Will Happer, and uh, actually William Happer, but uh, years ago my brother started call him, calling me Will, so people have called me that ever since. And um, I'm a physicist. I uh, uh, have been on the faculty at Princeton for many years, and before that at Columbia University. And uh, I've spent uh, parts of my life in Washington on government service, and so I've done a little startup company, so I've done the usual thing for, for academics. My field is interaction of radiation and matter. I've done a lot of work on optical pumping, spin polarization from light to atoms and nuclei, and I formed a little company that was based on work in our laboratory that uses spin polarized nuclei of helium-3 and xenon for lung imaging. They're using it now to some extent in some of the COVID studies. So I know a lot about the interaction of radiation and matter and greenhouse gases and stuff like that. That's my profession. I do earn my living that way. I got interested in physics because um, uh, I was born in India where my mother was a uh, medical missionary, a, a doctor. There she met my father who was a uh, British Army doctor, a, a Scot, and they had rival hospitals in the south of India, and so uh, I guess they decided to join forces. Anyway, that's how I came to be. But when World uh, War II broke out, Japanese were moving uh, all across Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Burma, and they were on the edges of India, and my father had to go to war since he was in the army, he's in the Indian army. And so he thought it would be safer to send us back to America, and my mother and me. I was just a toddler then, and she was pregnant with my brother. And uh, so he put us on a ship in Bombay, and we sailed around South Africa to try and avoid German submarines. And up the coast of South America it was by far the, a very circuitous way, but we got here safely. Not, not all the ships did. Some of them were sunk. And my mother needed a job. America was still not in the war. So she got a job as the first doctor at Oak Ridge at the Manhattan Project there, you know. And so as a preschooler, I remember Oak Ridge and the physicists and the chemists, the other people working on the bomb. And I thought, gee, this uh, looks like an interesting way to make a living. I wonder if I'd be good enough to be a, a physicist. And so uh, that was what piqued my interest, and uh, I never lost that interest, and uh, so I eventually did train as a physicist and uh, got my degree at Princeton University and uh, moved on to Columbia. So uh, that's a little background as to how I got into the sciences, science business, which I'm still in to this day. And, uh, I, one of the things that got me interested in climate was um, as a result of some of the uh, consulting work I had done for the government in the 80s, uh, I had solved an uh, important problem involved in uh, the Strategic Defense Initiative, the Star Wars initiative of President Reagan. So uh, this involved high-energy laser propagation out to space, and the problem with that is even if you have a high-power laser, if you aim it at an incoming missile, by the time the uh, laser beam reaches the missile, there's uh, so much interaction with atmospheric turbulence that by the time it gets to the missile, instead of focusing down to a single spot with all of you know, your many hundreds of kilowatts of power and burning up the missile, it focuses down into lots of little beamlets, little speckles, mm -hmm. instead of a deadly spot. And uh, this was well known to astronomers. I mean, uh, Willie uh, soon would be very familiar with the speckle pattern for stars. Once you get a telescope much bigger than about this, uh, the resolution of the telescope doesn't increase. It, it gets bigger and bigger, and you get more and more light on your film. But if you look closely, it's, it's not a point source of a star, but it's lots and lots of little speckles, and they 
bounce around every few milliseconds, every 10 milliseconds or so because of the warm and cool patches of air that drift overhead between you and the star. And so astronomers knew how to uh, fix this problem in a few special cases. For example, if you were looking at a very dim star close to an extremely bright one, but they're almost at the same position in space, you can use the bright star to measure the um, distortions of the atmosphere and then instead of using a, a beautiful curved mirror with a perfect surface, you distort the mirror slightly so that it has the inverse of the perturbations of the atmosphere. And then when the light bounces off of it, it bounces off as a perfectly converging spherical wave. It's called a rubber mirror. It's adaptive optics. And it really does work, but you have to be able to measure the atmosphere first. And so when I had heard about this problem, I uh, said, well, I know how you could probably solve this because it's possible to make an artificial star anywhere in space. You don't have to rely on there being a missile coming from the direction of the star Sirius or Vega or something like that. They might not shoot from that direction. But you can make an equally bright star by using the sodium layer. So I, I happen to know about this layer of sodium atoms at 100 kilometers and a I knew that uh, uh, there was enough of it that you got a lot of backscatter from sodium. You know, numbers are important in climate. A lot of people don't understand there's a, a difference between qualitative uh, statements and quantitative statements. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a famous dose makes the poison, you know. Uh, <laughs> so you really have to know the dose. And at any rate, you know, there are lots of other atoms up there that people have thought about trying to use. The only one that's there in enough abundance is sodium. And uh, I happen to know that. I explained how to make a star. I said, you, you know, people are, have already experimented and uh, you can see it every night at uh, twilight. You know, when the sun sets, you can see this glow of sodium atoms for 30 minutes or so just after sundown, and so it was known that it was there. So all you need to do is make a laser that uh, is tuned to the sodium line. That wasn't so easy then, but to their credit, the Air Force invested the money to make one of the first sodium probe lasers, and they set up a uh, special uh, observatory, secret observatory, just south of uh, Albuquerque in New Mexico, out in the desert, and brought in their new laser and uh, turned it on, and it, it really worked the first time. So, <laughs> so it really uh, it turned out to be a big success. Anyway, partly as a result of that, I got a fair amount of notoriety in the classified world. It was uh, very secret for 10 years. People didn't know about it. It was finally declassified and because astronomers needed it. And it's used on all high-power telescopes today. If you go to uh, Hawaii or Chile, you'll often see this yellow beam going into the sky. That's, that's my sodium guide star. <laughs> What an amazing thing to tell your kids or show your kids, well, that's my laser. Yeah, you know? yeah well, <laughs> it's not so much my laser, but it's my idea. Well, you know, I think <laughs> you, can, you can say that to your kids. Though. Yeah. Anyway, as a result of that, there were a lot of people in Washington who knew that, knew that I uh, had helped them and uh, that uh, what I said was often true. So they invited me to become director of energy research under uh, Admiral Watkins and uh, George uh, Bush uh, senior. And so that's when I first began to uh, get interested in climate because I had a big budget. I had three and a half million dollars and it was bigger than the NSF budget actually at the time. And so uh, I thought well I ought to figure out what we're spending our money for and try and make sure that uh, the taxpayer is getting <laughs> a good deal for all this money we're putting out there. And so I would um, insist that each week some principal investigator who we were funding from DOE would come in and give me and my uh, associate directors a little seminar on what they were doing, why they were doing it, and most people when they got this invitation were just thrilled that some Washington bureaucrat even cared what they were doing and so they couldn't wait to come to Washington and give a talk and we sat around in a small room and had a projector and ask questions, and um, I thought it was great, you know, so people would come in and tell me about the latest gene sequencing machines that we were paying for, you know, DOE has a long history in genetics because of the 
concern about genetic damage from radiation. So we were uh, a key player in the uh, Human Genome Project and, and making the first sequencing machines. People would come in and tell me about deep drilling, you know, to see what kind of bacteria showed up at 10,000 feet from, you know, drill cores. And amazing, there's life is wherever you look. <laughs> and uh, So uh, these uh, seminars I, I was fond of, and uh, most of the participants, I think, were fond of them too. They regarded it very positive to be able to come and explain to Washington funders what they were doing. Uh, but there was an exception. It was the uh, climate people, the environmentalists. So, I was extremely surprised, but when we would invite someone to come and tell us about what's the latest on uh, clouds, radiation forcing from clouds, water vapor, they, they would at first say, no, we're not going to come. You know, we, uh, we work for Senator Gore and uh, we don't work for you. And I said, well, you better check your contract because um, if you want him to pay for you, that's fine. But, but you're, <laughs> if you want me to continue paying, you have to come down like everybody else and explain what you're doing. You know, I have to defend you, you know, to an often hostile Congress and I need to be eloquent about why this is a good investment. So they would grudgingly come and then they would give these very defensive seminars uh, with no content. It was just pablum. And, uh, you know, I would ask a question as I asked other people and they would say, why, why are you asking me? You know, uh, don't you trust me? I said, no, no. I mean, I ask everybody a question. How can I understand it if I don't ask? And, uh, but they felt that they were being, uh, 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 persecuted, you know, when you would ask a scientific question. And um, in fact, one of them had the nerve to say, well, what answer would you like? And uh, <laughs> I've never made sure whether that was a joke or not. You know, I don't think it was a joke, but, yeah. you know, maybe it was. It's certainly not a very appropriate joke. <laughs> so about what year was this? Oh, this was uh, 1992, 93, around that time. Well, of course, um, the next election was won by... Uh, Clinton and Gore, and uh, since I was a political appointee of uh, Mr. Bush, uh, uh, I expected to go back to Princeton. I was glad to go back, but they asked me to stay around, and I did for uh, several months. I was the only one left from the previous administration, but uh, one morning, uh, the Secretary of Energy, Hazel O'Leary, a, bl a black woman, a very capable, smart woman was secretary and we got along fine. I liked her and uh, vice versa. She called me in and she said, Will, what have you done to uh, Al Gore? I said, I haven't done anything to Al Gore. <laughs> What's the problem? Well, she says, I have to fire you. And, uh, you know, I really would like to keep you. I can make you a civil servant. Then uh, you'll be immune from uh, <laughs> political, you know, political things like this. Uh, we'd like you to say, uh, I said, well, thanks, Hazel. But, you know, I'm happy to go back to Princeton, you know, I, my uh, profession really isn't being a bureaucrat, but being a scientist, and there are a lot of things I want to be working on, and good luck, and, you know, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so then I went back to Princeton, and I sort of forgot about climate, because I was busy working on, you know, the spin polarization of atoms and nuclei, I think I mentioned earlier, and it was using all of my time. And then we set up a little startup company that used up a lot of time. And so a number of years passed where I, you know, I was interested, but I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. And then I got back into it as uh, alarmists got crazier and crazier. You know, I couldn't stand it. And uh, people would interview me and say, well, you don't know anything about this. Well, I said, I'm, I know more than most, you know, it's not my profession, but I, you know, I certainly know about radiation transfer as much as they do, probably more. And so uh, I began to get more and more uh, public about uh, my criticisms. And, and that's continued to this day. That's what I hope to do here this weekend at, at our meeting. <laughs>